Good morning, everybody. We joined this morning by Chantelle from Fair Tree Capital. We've asked her to talk about how the South African business environment will feature after the current crisis we're going through, to share some ideas on their thoughts on what will be the challenges going forward and how they incorporate that into their, their Fair Tree process and the way they position their funds. Over to you, Chantelle. Thanks, Nadine. Thanks for your time, guys. Um, so the full impact of this crisis remains largely fluid and uncertain, but the near-term pain will be severe and felt by many sectors and companies. That said, we believe opportunities exist within the South African equity market. Given the externalization of our equity market, even when the local macro is weak or at the moment dire, we can access other opportunity sets such as resources, offshore growth, natural czar hedges, which are largely unaffected by the South African macro. We've applied our minds on what could be a permanent shock versus a temporary shock from COVID. We believe that many things that we did before COVID will resume in exactly the same shape and form after the pandemic has dissipated and economies are fully opened. However, some will not. Some things will have been accelerated ahead of their planned trajectory, such as food delivery, e-commerce, virtuality, and some things may never exist again, such as large conferences that can be conducted virtually going forward. These are the permanent behavioral changes that we need to identify and be cognizant of when investing. When investing in these very uncertain times, we try to focus on three key considerations. Firstly, does the company have a robust balance sheet? Secondly, how sustainable are its cash earnings? And thirdly, does it have a defensive business model with little or no exposure to the potential adverse permanent shocks of this pandemic? Or at least does the company have the willingness and ability to adapt their business model to these shocks? What we can apply in determining which South African businesses should withstand the expected severe economic downturn is embedded within Fairtree's investment process, and it's part of our analysis of total shareholder return, which comprises of three elements, valuation, dividends, and cash generation. We spend most of our time focusing on earnings generation, or more importantly, cash generation, which differs from accounting earnings. If a company can sustainably, sustainably generate cash, it has the ability to pay dividends or secure assets for future growth. And this bolsters total shareholder return and it justifies the company trading at a premium to a company in the same sector with far weaker cash generating abilities. What do we mean by robust balance sheet? Well, leverage is important, we agree. It allows a company to expand, to invest, to secure future growth. However, going into any downturn, you want to avoid companies that are too stretched financially as weaker earnings are quickly depleted by finance costs, EOH as an example. When too levered, a company can easily spiral into distress. And if the environmental environment turns sour, this is where they're forced to raise cash at all costs by either disposing of their most profitable assets or raising further far more expensive debt, or raising equity at extreme discounts. Sassel is a good example of a company in this distressed balance sheet spiral. Further, it's not only the absolute level of debt, but the quality and the sustainability of the cash which services that debt. If debt is denominated in a hard currency, however, the cash servicing this debt is generating in an emerging market currency, a global downturn can amplify the pressure on the serviceability of that debt. MTN and Aspen are good examples of this. An experienced quality management team who have a track record for smart capital allocation is key to try and avoid a stress, distressed balance sheet. We prefer companies with robust balance sheets, as well as management who can demonstrate good capital allocation decisions, such as Sunlum, Mr. Price, and Capitec. Cash generation and the sustainability of it must be scrutinized. We believe the resource sector offers great opportunity, as it is in a far more favorable position than it was in both the 2008 
as well as the 2015 commodity downturns, where their balance sheets were too leveraged. Since 2015, the general mining companies, as well as the precious metal counters, have been repairing their balance sheets, reducing debt, and being ultra conservative on new projects and capex spend. Metal prices, most notably in gold and palladium, have increased substantially over the last year. However, many of the equities have not priced in the higher metal prices, nor the fact that these resource companies are generating significant levels of cash and have decade low debt levels. The PGM companies have strong balance sheets and the underlying investment thesis is not being compromised by this um, crisis. Valuations are at extreme levels, even though the metal prices have softened of late. Although we expect the demand for the industrial metals, palladium and rhodium to weaken due to lower vehicle sales, the disruptions in supply of the metal caused by the lockdown and mine closure for a period largely has offset this weaker demand, which supports their price. We are of the view that we are still at early stages of a very long upturn cycle in the PGM space. The pandemic outbreak has merely paused or disrupted the cycle. And one of the permanent shocks we're starting to see in the developed world, as well as China, is that people, as people start to return to work, they are avoiding public transport. This will be very supportive of passenger vehicle sales and ultimately the use of PGMs. We continue to believe that gold is embarking on its third major bull run of the post-war period, and it offers a great defense to any portfolio with the equities trading at attractive valuations. Monetary and fiscal policies globally are super accommodative. While the economic uncertainty and ge geopolitical risks are growing. Remember, 2020 is a US election year, and we've seen a leaked Republican strategy document that sets out the agenda for the 2020 Trump campaign. Don't defend Trump, attack China. This is the rhetoric developing from the Republicans, and it's going to only heighten global uncertainty, which will be very supportive of safe haven assets such as gold. Gold has managed to strengthen even as the dollar remained firm. If the dollar begins to soften, gold will get yet another wind of support. With yields collapsing near to zero, government bonds will no longer offer the same degree of protection to investment portfolios as they did in the past. This increases the allure of holding gold, and we see much opportunity in the gold equities. If we look at general mining, it's very encouraging that China's started to, to restart again. The economy um, has started to begin running, and they've got significant stimulus. And we've seen steel prices tick up. This supports the price of iron ore, which we believe will remain resilient, with many supply side shocks and weaknesses from Brazil and Australia, both low cost producers. We're of the view that oil will remain weak this year, given the demand destruction from the lockdown and travel bans, as well as the breakdown of the OPEC plus cartel. Lower oil prices will benefit the input costs of these mining players. The diversified miners offer attractive valuations and upside potential, and we have access to both the local miners as well as offshore plays listed on our exchange. High cash generation allows a company the opportunity to return cash to shareholders through dividends, buybacks, or secure acquisitive growth through acquisitions. Many South African corporates have suspended their dividends until the market stabilizes again. While more companies could follow in the near term, we would be cautious of companies whose investment case relies solely on dividend distribution, such as the property sector. Our South African property REIT sector pre-COVID was already facing two significant long-term challenges, namely higher geared off, highly geared offshore structures, which are unsustainable, and they've boosted their dividends unsustainably. These are going to have to be unwound. And secondly, property valuations that have not adjusted to the reality of far higher South African risk and negative rental revisions. The fall of EDCON has weakened the sector even further. The major REITs should be able to continue as a going concern. However, their dividends are going to be much lower. 
We would argue that their share prices better reflect the above mentioned issues. And this could present an opportunity for an increase in exposure to some of the SA REIT names which are sold off. But we would be cautious. Stick to the ones that have stronger balance sheets and better underlying asset portfolios. Namely resilience, it has a low offshore gearing structure and it has exposure to Eastern European property through NEPI, which remains in a growth phase and is undersupplied. And then Fortress, again, low offshore gearing. It also has a stake in NEPI and its South African asset base are skewed towards logistics. We expect industrial and office property to remain under pressure due to weak GDP and complete oversupply in the office space. Another permanent shock could be the destruction and demand of office space, given corporates drive to cut costs, as well as many corporates ability to work remotely as evidenced through this lockdown period. The retail sector remains challenged due to demand being wiped out by the national lockdown, and again, an oversupply of the retail space in South Africa. There are, however, pockets of positive performance. And this is namely in retail centers which are positioned closer to township catchment areas or public transport nodes. This is where resilient Fortress and Bukili's retail property portfolio stand out. The logistics sector, as well as storage, will continue to outperform. Again, another permanent shock from this virus as we see it more of a shift towards online and which has been further accelerated. What do we mean by defensive business models? These are ones that we believe can withstand these mentioned permanent shocks from the virus. An example of this permanent shock is social distancing. When we experience a global shock of this nature, there will be permanent effects from the crisis. One of which is the prolonged impact of social distancing, where industries which rely heavily on public gatherings Public transport, including air travel, and corporate movements will be adversely impacted. Tourism, travel, sports, hospitality, and some luxury spend will be devastated from this crisis. Corporates account for much air travel, as well as hospitality, accommodation, and rentals. It's not only the volume, but the profitability of corporate travel. For example, business travels account for a mere 12% of most airline passenger numbers. However, they are typically twice as profitable. In fact, some flights, business passengers represent 75% of an airline's profits. Given that most corporate engagements have continued throughout this global lockdown by virtual means, such as Zoom, it will be tough for corporates to justify lavish and extended travel in the future. And this could pose permanent damage to the profitability of some of the aforementioned sectors, including office space in the SA property sector, as we discussed. Where some will lose, some will win. There are some sectors that have been net benefactors of the lockdown. Tencent provides a resilient financial outlook amid the outbreak. In particular, Tencent Digital Entertainment Operations which is a fancy word for gaming, has benefited immensely along with their digital services such as WeChat, video, music, news, and search from increased demand as consumers work from home. We have access to the likes of Tencent through Naspas and Process, and we believe Tencent offers a structural growth story and one which will have future revenue benefits. Given the lockdown impact, and the focus that China has embarked on to continue to have an adva advancement of artificial intelligence and cloud capacity. If we turn to South Africa, SA Inc. for a moment, we remain cautious on SA encounters in the near term, and we expect further pain in the sector from the halt in economic activity, with little sight of when this lockdown will lift. We have been underweight SA encounters for the last two years, and this was due to the weak SA macro, significant structural headwinds, and fragile energy supply. That said, some stocks screen very attractively from a valuation perspective, and they do have defensive business models and robust balance sheets. Given the prospects of even further rate cuts from the Saab, low oil prices for longer, as well as some pockets of the economy having already opened up, albeit painfully slow, we believe the South African retail sector 
most notably credit retail, such as Truworth's food retailers, such as Spa and Woolworths, offer some defense and could fare well. There are also some defensive financial counters which offer great opportunities. We would shy away from the large banks. Although defensive, they are very sensitive to lower interest rates given the negative endowment effect that they suffer. This coupled with a slowdown in consumption activity, the banks stand to disappoint from an earnings perspective. We are constructive on South Africa in the longer term. And we believe that we could see significant recovery once we're through this global pandemic and the lockdown is lifted with low oil prices, low interest rates, high precious metal prices, and the government's willingness to tackle its weak balance sheet by attacking the public wage bill and cutting loose some of the unsalvage unsalvageable SOEs. We believe the revenue service and national prosecuting authority are self-healing and if we were to see justice for some large scale corruption and state capture, it may be a catalyst for confidence. We are all frustrated by the lockdown, which seems like more of a crisis than the virus itself. But we are all working with imperfect information, including the president's. And this imperfect medical information is changing constantly. We need to allow for some time to process new information as it arrives. And we need to exercise some patience with our president and the decision makers. We hope that communication is improved and the next national address is one of opening up the economy and putting the ownership of the risk of this crisis back into the hands of our people. Thank you for your time, Nadine.